Well, welcome to our worship of God as we gather together here at Harlandale Christian Church. We're so glad that you have joined us today, those who are here in the house of worship and those who are joining with us online. We just pray that God's uh, blessing and his peace and comfort for each one of us as we come to lift up his blessed and holy name. The psalmist reminds us of this in Psalm 42 as he says, As the Lord pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? My tears have been my food day and night, while people say to me all day long, Where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I used to go to the house of God under the protection of the Mighty One with shouts of joy and praise among the festive throng. Why, my soul, are you cast down? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise Him, my Savior and my God. Let's go to our Savior and our God in prayer as we begin this worship time and, and dedicate this hour of worship to him. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for drawing us together, for calling us together into this worship service uh, so that we can fellowship with each other, so that we can know your, your presence among us through your Holy Spirit, so that we can remember your grace and mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, as your great gift to us, and so that we can remember and praise you for your protection and your provision for us each day. Our Father, we do lift up your blessed name and your holy name, and we thank you for all that you've done for us and all that you will do for us. We pray that you'll receive our, our praise and, and honor as we lift up your name during this service and, and in our lives. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. As the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs after you. Yield. You alone are my heart's desire. 
come to the time in our worship service where we partake of the communion participate in the communion service and we also return our tithes and our offerings in our worship and, and adoration of our God we think of these words as we remember we share in these emblems today in this communion service the bread representing the blood uh, the, the body uh, the flesh of Jesus Christ and the, the cup the fruit of the vine representing the blood that Jesus shed and each as uh, our forgiveness was purchased by his death burial and his resurrection we remember that it's a time honored practice no matter what the catalog or the category of crime the felon in our prison system is not really released He's unlocked. The guard unlocks the cell, the shackles, the doors, and he puts the prisoner on a, on a van to be taken to the bus station. There he's given a voucher for travel to his hometown and the phone number of his parole agent. One has to ask, is this really a good way to help a sinner maintain his repentance? And the answer is given. The memory of his punishment will do that. But somehow it doesn't seem to work as advertised. 
But how different it is for the child of Christ. The price for our sins, the price of our sins, was not paid by our imprisonment, but by Christ's pain and suffering on the cross. We're not cast off and cast out. Instead, we're welcomed into the church, the family of God. And we're, we're not left to find our own way. We are strengthened by those around us and guided by God's word. But the prison system has taught us one thing, the memory of his punishment we need to be rem reminded of what it cost the sinless, the perfect Son of God to provide for us. We didn't suffer, He did. And often enough, that keeps the suffering out of our minds and, and away from our, our concepts. So God has provided this memorial, this communion to remind us of that punishment. One reason that we take communion is so that we'll remember the pain and the suffering of our Lord, pain and suffering which we, we rightly deserve. And by his stripes we are healed, by his sacrifice we are saved from hell. But it really goes beyond that. The prisoner often sees his life as needing no change other than being smarter next time, so as not to get caught if he tries some of the same things again. But as Christians, we see a life that does need to change, to become more like Christ. And as we do this, we discover that fear gives way to love and joy. Think about this. Prisoners are unlocked. Saints, Christians, are set free. Our communion and offering song today is the old rugged cross. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity that we have to, to gather at this Lord's table and, and share and remember in this communion service. We thank you that he didn't just uh, unchain us from a cell, but you set us free from our sins through the perfect sacrifice, through the sacrifice of your perfect Son, Jesus Christ. Father, as we remember that old rugged cross and we remember the, the, the flesh and the blood that was given for our sins, help us to draw near. And even that, Father, help us to remember that, that as Christians, you have you've get, asked that we give to you not just our lives, but we return to you our tithes and our offerings for the work of your church, your service here on this earth. So bless our offerings after the communion, Father. And receive that even as, a, as our act of worship as we give ourselves to you. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Till
so despised by the world has a wondrous attraction for me for the dear lamb of god left his glory Jesus suffered and died to pardon and sanctify me. Well, as we be continue our series uh, from the book of James, uh, consider, uh, calling it the fake news, today we read from James chapter 3, beginning with verse 14 through verse, uh, chapter 4, verse 10. Who is a wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition if you're in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, even demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder in every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. And then verse 1 of chapter 4. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire but do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. 
When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means, means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think that scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the spirit he has caused to dwell in us? But he gives us more grace. That's why the scripture says God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. Submit yourselves then to, to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. Years ago, Tony Campolo wrote a book about Christianity called Who Switched the Price Tags? He, put, he told about the time that he and his best friend decided to break into the, five, the basement of the local five and dime store. They didn't plan to rob the place. Uh, they were Sunday school boys after all. Instead, they planned to do something that was far worse for the owner. Their plan was to break in and change the price tags on everything. I don't think they actually got beyond the planning stages, but they imagined customers arriving and discovering that radios were selling for a quarter and bobby pins were priced at $5 each. Campolo wrote, with diabolical glee, we wondered what it would be like when nobody could figure out what the prices of things really should be. You know, in a store, the price tags tell us the value of what we want to buy. But if someone switches the price tags, it's hard to know how valuable something is. And in the book of James, God rebukes Christians who seemingly can't read the price tags. Not for the things that, they, uh, that we see on the shelves at the store, but the price tags, essentially, of what's good and beneficial and what's wrong and, and evil. We've lost the understanding of how valuable things should be, but now, how is it that God knows that, that we've misread the price tags? Well, James writes, what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and you do not have, and so you murder. You covet and you cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. James 4, 1 and 2. You see, when Christians get into quarrels and fights, something's wrong. And God tells us that this is what's wrong. He says, you, are, you adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world is enmity or becoming an enemy with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. James 4, 3 and 4. In other words... When Christians fight and quarrel, it shows that they've put a higher value on the world than they have on God and God's way. They switch the price tax. They value the worldly so much more than the godly. In fact, Christians who fight and quarrel in, in the book of James, the Holy Spirit of God says that these Christians who fight and quarrel are called adulterous because they've apparently abandoned their first commitment to God for a commitment to the world. So what's going on here? Well, the root of the problem that James is talking about here is that some Christians have fallen in love with worldly goods, with our possessions. And that is an issue for many Christians. The lure of possessions and the, the promise of happiness is everywhere. 
people build their lives around how much money they have in their, in their 401k or their retirement assets and, and how many possessions they have in their, their homes and their garages. A preacher friend wrote in his blog about a friend named Gary who owned a business. And he was always struggling financially and he came to the preacher and he asked for advice. The preacher noticed that Gary always leased a brand new Trans Am. It was a few years ago every couple of years and he suggested that maybe he should downsize well gary was shocked and he said but god wants me to be happy doesn't he well gary's problem was that he was hooked on the idea that happiness could be found in his possessions out west i've read that there's a general store out in the middle of nowhere when travelers stop in, they see a sign that says, if you can't find it in this store, just ask us about the item, and we'll tell you how to get along without it. <laughs> and Jesus said it this way, you can't serve two masters. You'll either hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money in Matthew 6 24 you know this is a repeated theme throughout the scriptures only a fool clings to the things of this world one writer explained it this way Adam and Eve ate the forbidden fruit and they weren't even hungry as a result they ended up losing all they had in exchange for shame suffering and death Lot's wife fled from Sodom as God destroyed it, but then she looked back at the home she couldn't keep and became a pillar of salt. Achan stole a garment of gold from Jericho that he couldn't wear and silver and gold that he couldn't spend and ended up losing all that he had, including his life. Judas Iscariot for 30 pieces of silver which he had no occasion or conscience to use took his own life in shame and despair. Demas, a companion of Paul's, loved this world more than Jesus and he walked away from Christ and brought upon himself the wrath of God. Jesus in Matthew 26, 16, uh, uh, 16, 26 says, What shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? Trying to gain the world at the expense of your walk with God is a dangerous attempt. But I believe there's a way to avoid that kind of danger. And the key to avoiding this danger is found in Romans 10, verse 9. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You know, when someone wants to become a Christian, I usually uh, explain a few things to them. We'll talk about faith and repentance and baptism and so on. But when I talk to them about confessing Jesus as Lord, Sometimes I'll pull out my wallet and I explain that Romans 10 is not talking about confessing our sins. It's saying we need to confess Jesus as Lord. In the days of Jesus, if you called someone your Lord, it meant they owned you. You were the slave. They were the master. And as a slave, you own nothing. And by confessing Jesus as Lord, I'm telling Jesus, everything in this wallet is his. Everything in my retirement account is his. My house, my car, my kids, they all belong to him. How I spend his money should glorify him and not shame him. How I view my possessions, my goods, should always reflect the idea that what I own is really his. So the root of quarreling and fighting that James is talking about here is based on the fact that too many Christians switch the price tag and they fall in love with their worldly possessions more than they fall in love with God and his blessings. And when they cling to those possessions, 
they ultimately abandoned God. But there was something else that caught my attention here. It was that phrase where James 4.1 asks, what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? And then James tells us this often happens because we want something that we can't seem to get. Now, sometimes folks argue over possessions. You know, it happens a lot when families battle over inheritances. But other times, these conflicts come up because I want my way. I want something my way, and you won't let me have it. I can't get what I want my way, and so I'll argue with you. Just before James 4, 1 talks about quarreling and fighting, we read about the fact that earthly or worldly wisdom based on, is based on jealousy and selfish ambition. That all leads to disorder and every vile practice in James 3.16. And then by contrast to that, James tells us the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere, and a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. In James 3, 17 and 18. So think about it. Every time you or I get upset and argue and quarrel with someone, we tend to reflect a worldly vis a wisdom, a worldly point of view, a wisdom filled with disorder and vile practices, as some of the translations say it. What's that mean? It means that many Christians operate under the assumption that if I can insult someone enough or curse at them enough, or as is the case in most common practice, increase the volume of my voice enough, I can kowtow the other person into submission, and they can surrender by the force of my anger and indignation. I've done it, and I dare say most of you have as well, but that's exactly what James means by vile practices, evil practices. Do you know someone who will always argue that his political party was better than the other political party? Apparently our folks had relatives like this. I have one or two now. I remember hearing my father talk politics with people, but I also remember that he had a rule at the dinner table. There would be no discussion of politics. Why? because he'd seen his relatives argue about that stuff and he wasn't going to have that at his table. Dad's relative wanted his way. And he was so offensive that, that when he did so, it made Dad furious. And he wouldn't have anything to do with it. Now here's the deal. Many of us have fallen into that trap. We don't agree with someone. We think we're right and they're wrong. And so we quarrel and we fight. Now a lot of times that happens between us and non-Christians. And this conflict is fairly predictable because we tend to tick worldly people off in this world. Why? Because we don't agree with much of what the world believes. They get upset with our refusal to accept their point of view on things and, and they in turn end up insulting our faith or our God. And so we get into arguments over things that they reject. You know that Jesus said that this is going to happen. If you were of the world, he said, the world would love you as its own, but because you're not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, Therefore, the world hates you in John 15, 19. But why do people get angry at us if we glorify Jesus? Mostly because when we say Jesus saved us, when he, we say that he's changed us, we're saying Jesus is the only way to heaven. And Jesus did say, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. In John 14, 6, that's pretty definite. That doesn't leave much leeway there. 
Think about this. In ancient Rome, this commitment by Christians to Christ led the Romans to hate Christians and Christianity. They even called Christians atheists. Atheists. Why would the Romans call Christians atheists? Well, because early Christians refused to worship the Roman gods. And that made the Romans mad. And that hasn't changed for all these centuries since. There are people today who get mad at Christians because we refuse to acknowledge and accept sins in our society and life choices that are different from ours. Why? Because they think folks ought to have the right to do as they please and live life just however they want to. But we know that the Bible tells us that much of the, the things that go on in our society and people's choices in lives are contrary to the scriptures. We know that the Bible tells us that, things are, that these things are sin and there are consequences to those sins. And so we reject those life choices as being valid and that makes them mad. Paul said in Ephesians 5, you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetous, or that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of, Christ, kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words because, because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not become partners with them. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. So we're always going to be at odds with the world. And we're always going to be in conflict with the world because of our love and our commitment to Christ that stands against the ways of the world. But we've got to be careful how we respond to worldly people. We've got to be careful not to get into arguments and quarrels because when we do get into these quarrels, we become like the world. We, imit we imitate the style of conflict. There's an old saying that says, you never want to wrestle with a pig. You just get dirty and the pig enjoys it. And that's a pretty lighthearted jab at what happens way too often to too many Christians. We get upset, we say things we shouldn't say, and we even insult people who are non-Christians. But too often, we also do it to people who are our brothers and sisters in Christ. Christians get mad at each other because they can't get their way. They'll insult and threaten and manipulate and it comes down to this God says don't do that why as James records it because when we do that when we quarrel and fight like that we are imitating the world that's how the world behaves but God says the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere, and a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace in James 3, 17 and 18. If our behavior towards each other and towards those who are outside the church is not peaceable, gentle, open to reason, etc., then we shame our God. And God will not reward us. We've looked for our own way on our terms and not his. And so God says, you don't have because you don't. What was that word again? Ask. Ask? Ask who? Well, we didn't ask God. God will not reward us if we rely on the worldly practice of fighting to get our way. The only way you'll get what God would give you is to ask him. 
and to rely on him for the outcome. And if we're guided by God's wisdom rather than the wisdom of this world, then we will accomplish the will of God. Let's stop switching the price tags and let's put full value on God's will and God's way and not the world's way. I read this testimony from a Christian church, Church Christ preacher. He says, I learned this lesson early in my first ministry. In the first church I served, there was a couple there. Leela was a faithful Christian and a member of the church. Marvin was a woodworker and a decent man who would show up about once a month. I suspect it was to please his wife, but he wasn't a Christian. And he really had no desire to be involved in church. Now, I was new to the pulpit there, and I'd, I'd made a, vi a, a goal to visit every member of the congregation. I set up an appointment with, with Marvin and Leela, and I sat uh, up with them one night and went to visit. I had no intention to talk doctrine or church. I just wanted to get to know them. And all was going well until one of their relatives showed up. And this woman and her husband were hardcore Baptists, and they knew that I was the new preacher at the Church of Christ. And then they want to talk doctrine. They wanted to talk baptism. In fact, they wanted to argue with me, but I hadn't come out here to argue. I just wanted to visit with this couple. And these people kept wanting to drag me into a quarrel. I did my best to stay out of the mud, but when I went out to my car to go home, I was depressed. This whole argument thing had shattered my night and I just knew that I had failed. He says the next Sunday, Leela was there in church and so was Marvin. The Sunday after that, Leela was there and so was Marvin. Marvin showed up to church for several weeks in a row, and I began to think, maybe I hadn't failed so badly in my visit with them. And then one day, Marvin called and asked if I'd come out and talk with him. We went into his wood shop, and he talked about everything under the sun, the weather, the skill of working with wood, and so on, and so on. After about 20 minutes, I said, I've enjoyed our conversation, but I got the impression that you really wanted to talk to me about something special. What's on your mind? You know what he said? He said, I want to be baptized. When do you want to do it? Right now. And they went to the, the church, to the baptistry, and baptized him. Later they were talking about it, and he asked him about all of this and he said the reason that I've never done this before the, ne the reason that I never came to church the reason I never uh, accepted Christ and was baptized and why, the reason I never made this decision before apparently everyone he'd ever met all they wanted to do was argue about religion they try to argue him into Christ whether it was his relative or the preachers. One preacher even went so far as to try to shame him into going to church with something like, you've got good enough clothes to come to church, don't you, Marvin? Yep, just not to your church, Marvin replied. Well, the point is simple. We don't accomplish the will of God using the wisdom and the practices of this world. We can't switch the tags and be successful. We can't argue or shame people into faith. We must reflect the wisdom of God to accomplish God's will. And God's wisdom, James says, is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. James reminds us that our calling 
is first to accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and our Savior, and then to live our lives as his image to all of those around us. Instead of showing and acting like the world, he calls us to let people see God, to let people see Jesus and the Holy Spirit in us. And we can't do that alone. We need that salvation from Jesus, from God. And we need the Holy Spirit of God in our lives every day to help us. Let's just stop switching price tags and do things God's way. Our song of decision and dedication today is, Lord, I need you. And oh, even in this day and age, how much more is that the true statement and a valid, uh, a valuable statement. Will you say that to the Lord today as we sing this song? Lord, I need you. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you that you, through your spirit, gave these words to James to point out to the church in his day. And yet you have given them to us today to give us a clear a clear statement, a clear, a clear instruction. As Christians, we stop doing worldly things and live in your will and do godly things. Help us, Father. Help us as we know and as we study and learn more of your will. Your Spirit gives us understanding and strength. Oh, Lord, we need you. We need your salvation. We need your grace and your mercy. And we need your help to live in your way and in your will every day. Bless us in that, Father. Draw us near to you, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. My right. 
กาแถววันนี้